There's four things to understand about this audience um, that the book is written to. The first of the four things is that the audience is believers. I'm more convinced than I've ever been before that this is written to a saved, regenerated, believing audience. And Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost, in his commentary on the book of Hebrews, A Faith That Endures is the title of it, uh, at the introduction gives some wonderful reasons as to why this is a believing audience. And let me take you through some of those reasons right now. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, it says, In these last days he has spoken to us, us. So the author is identifying with the spiritual status of his audience by using the word us. So if the author was saved, and he surely was, then so was his audience. As you look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it talks about how the sins of the audience have been purged. It says, he is the radiance of the glory of the exact representation of his nature. He upholds all things by the power of his word when he made purification of sins. The audience seems to indicate that their sins have been purified, which would fit a believing audience. If you look at Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Notice that the audience was not rejecting salvation. They were neglecting salvation. You can't neglect something unless you have something to neglect. You have the same kind of idea in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14, where it speaks there of Paul writing to Timothy not to neglect his spiritual gift. You can't neglect a spiritual gift unless you have a spiritual gift. It's like uh, when you tell a husband you're neglecting your wife, well, you have to have a wife to neglect. If you don't have a wife, you can't neglect a wife. So the fact that they are neglecting their salvation indicates that they already had salvation. If you look at chapter 3, verse 1, they are called their holy brethren, partakers in the heavenly calling. That's describing, obviously, a saved person. The word brethren is used in this particular epistle 10 times. Now, six of those 10 times, it's a clear reference to a believing brother, like a holy brother. It uses that kind of terminology. Just let me give you this list. Chapter 2, verse 11. Chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 12. Chapter 10, verse 19. Chapter 13, verses 22 and 23. You'll notice also when you go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, that the audience needs rest. Uh, It says there, Therefore let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest. It doesn't say they need salvation. It says they need rest. As you go down to uh, chapter 4, verse 3, it talks about the audience being fellow believers together with the author. He says there in chapter 4, verse 3, for we who have believed enter that rest. We who have believed. So whoever the audience is, um, the author is saying, you're a fellow believer with me, which is a, a clear description of a saved Uh, individual. As you look at chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, we have a high priest. Chapter 4, verse 14, therefore, since we have a high priest, the author says, I have a high priest and you have a high priest. Now, an unsaved person has nothing of the sort. As you go to chapter 4, verse 16, it talks about how let us Draw near with confidence to the throne room of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in time of need. Uh, The author says, I have a high priest that I can draw near to, so do you. An unbeliever doesn't have that. As you look at chapter 10, verses 36 through 39, the big call that the audience needs there is they need endurance. Finish the course. He says in verse 36 of chapter 10, for therefore you have need of endurance. He doesn't say you need salvation. He says you need to endure in the salvation that you already possess. As you go down to chapter 10, verses 22 through 25, it indicates that they have been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. 22, it says, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith Having our, see how the author keeps identifying with the spiritual status of his audience? 
having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Such a thing could never be saved of an unsaved person. They are, chapter 9, verse 14, serving the living God. Unbelievers don't have an ability to serve God. It says, chapter 9, verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? They were already serving the Lord. In chapter 10, verse 10, they are called sanctified by this we have been sanctified. We, the writer says, I've been sanctified and so have you. An obvious description of a saved, regenerated person. In chapter 10 and verse 15, it looks like they already have the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It says, and the Holy Spirit also testified to us. So I have the Holy Spirit, the writer says, and so do you. As you look at uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it indicates that Jesus is the author and finisher of their faith. He says in chapter 12, 1 and 2, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run the race with endurance, the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. For them to say something like that indicates that they were already in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 12 and verse 7, they are called sons of God. It says in Hebrews 12 verse 7, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? So they Uh, We're not enemies of God. Romans 5 verse 10 indicates that's what unbelievers are, but they were sons or inheritors. So again, this is obviously a reference to a saved person. In chapter 12 and verse 28, it indicates that they were inheriting a kingdom. Chapter 12 verse 28 says, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken. So they were already sons or inheritors of a coming kingdom. An unsaved person has no such privilege. So when we just kind of put aside our theology and we just let the text say what it wants to say, you know, the audience very clearly is regenerated. The audience very, very clearly is saved. In fact, in this particular book, there are 38 exhortations, 38 commands. And those commands only fit people that already have the Holy Spirit or the resources of God inside of them. You'll notice all the way through this book, there's not a single command to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Obviously, such a command doesn't exist because the author is assuming that his audience is already a saved, uh, regenerated audience. Now, John's gospel, remember what it says in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31? It says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. There's a command in John's gospel to believe because he's writing to people that were unbelievers. There's no similar command whatsoever in the book of Hebrews. So when you put all of this together, the audience is a regenerated audience. Something else to note about this audience is they were second generation Christians. We can infer that from Hebrews 2 verses 3 and 4. It says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation after it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard it. Notice you've got three groups of people here. You've got the Lord, those who heard the Lord, um, that would be generation number two following the Lord. That would be the apostles. And then it says it was spoken to us by those who first heard it. The us is generation number three. So essentially what happened is you have the Lord and the Lord is imputing his truth to the apostles. The The apostles are imputing their truth that they learned from the Lord to the next generation. And as the truth moved from the apostles to the next generation, verse 3 indicates that it was confirmed 
by confirmatory signs and wonders. So by the time it got to this group here, we're dealing not with that apostolic generation, but the second generation of Christians, because the trajectory is from the Lord to the apostolic generation, those who heard, and then to us. So we're dealing with a second generation of Christians. That actually is going to become very important when I explain the uh, basic uh, uh, issue that's taking place in the book of Hebrews with the audience. I know a lot of this probably at this point just seems like uh, information overload, but I'm showing you things that have a tremendous bearing on how the book is interpreted. So these are believers these are second generation believers. They're obviously Jewish. <laughs> we know that from the title of the book. Uh, the title can be found as early as in different manuscripts, as early as AD 180. And the writer is obviously um, a Jewish people, and the audience are obviously Jewish people because they have a great familiarity with the Old Testament system which is discussed some in this book, a great deal. Great, There's a great deal of knowledge that the author and the audience both seem to possess about key Jewish rituals and Jewish history. I don't think there's Gentiles in this audience because you don't have the kind of Jew-Gentile issues that Paul is dealing with in the book of Ephesians, where he talks about Jew and Gentile coming together in one new man, Ephesians 2, Romans 11, Paul, you know, will deal with uh, the whole topic of God is at work through the predominantly Gentile church as Israel temporarily has been given over to a spiritual darkness, a spiritual stupor. But when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then God will remove the veil from the Jewish people. Those kind of Jew-Gentile issues, Romans 11, you have nothing like that happening in the book of Hebrews there's no Ephesians 2 kind of issues here happening in Hebrews. There's no Romans 11 kind of issues happening in Hebrews. It's just uh, a book that is written to Hebrew Christians, Hebrew believers, Jewish believers, which means the book of Hebrews is part of a special collection of New Testament books, many of which are written to a very select group within the body of Christ, Jews that happen to be believers in Yeshua or the Lord Jesus Christ. So there are six such books. Those are the Gospel of Matthew, the book of Hebrews, the book of James, the books of 1 Peter and 2 Peter, and also the book of Jude. These are books that are written specifically to Jewish Christians. Paul himself, as we read earlier in Galatians 2 verses 7 and 8, indicates that while Paul had a ministry to the Gentiles, Peter had a ministry to the Jews. The audience of those two books is a Hebrew Christian audience. Jude is highly connected to 2 Peter, so we would assume that his book is written to a Hebrew a Christian audience. It's generally assumed that Matthew is the very first gospel written to Hebrew Christians while the church was still predominantly Jewish. James, written to the 12 tribes, sounds Jewish to me, uh, as you see in James chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 4, is written to a Hebrew Christian, Hebrew believing audience. And so the book of Hebrews is part of that, that mix of these special six books in the New Testament canon, written specifically to Hebrew Christians. Now, I'm a Gentile. Does that mean I can't learn anything from these books? Well, of course not. All Scripture is for us. But we just have to understand that when we analyze a book, we have to look at the specific audience that's being addressed. And so Hebrews is written to a group of people that are believers, second-generation believers, and Jewish now, where was this group located that the author is addressing? James in James chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, 1 Peter in chapter 1, verse 1. It's pretty clear that those books are written to the Jews in the diaspora or Jews living outside of the land of Israel that had been scattered. I don't think the book of Hebrews was written to those kinds of Jewish Christ, Jewish believing groups. I think the audience here is located 
in the land of Israel. They are probably living in Jerusalem, and they are probably living very near the temple, which was still functioning at the time the book of Hebrews was written. Um, Why do I think that? Because there's a massive uh, tendency that the author addresses And the author is trying to ward this off, as I'll explain. But these Jewish believers are wanting to go back to the temple system. Now, you can't go back to the temple system unless you're living, you know, near the temple system. The temple system up until AD 70 was functioning in the land of Israel in the city of Jerusalem. And that's where I think this audience was. For the temptation to return to the temple to be real, the audience must be located in close proximity to the temple in the land of Israel. And by this particular time, that land was called the land of Israel. Matthew chapter 2, verse 20 and 21 uh, refers to it. So the audience is located in the land of Israel, I would think near Jerusalem, near the temple system. So they're believers, they're second generation believers, they're Jewish and they're located in the land of Israel. And so all of that is going to be very helpful towards analyzing the different parts of this book. <laughs>